Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, Parks and Recreation Committee hearing on the state of the city's jointly operated playgrounds. I am Barry Grudenchik. I have the honor of chairing the Parks and Recreation Committee of the New York City Council for this council uh, term. I'm joined by uh, the counsel to the committee, Chris Sartori. Um, I am looking in no particular order from left to right, although I don't know if that holds politically. Um, Costa Costantanidis from Queens, Mark uh, Joni from the Bronx, Eric Ulrich from Queens, Peter Koo from Queens, Keith Powers from Manhattan, uh, Mark Levine from Manhattan, Ben Kalos from Manhattan, and Andy Cohn uh, from the great borough of the Bronx where I was born. He's also a committee member. Most of them are committee members. I want to thank you all for being here today and taking up uh, your valuable time and caring so much about this very, very important issue uh, relating to our city's parks. I'm going to read an opening statement, and then we're going to uh, hear from the administration first. Uh, they will be followed um, by uh, advocates, uh, parks advocates that um, we all know, and um, I have asked the administration to stick around in case, after you're done testifying, in case I want to bring you back up to answer some of the questions that may have been raised, some of the issues that may have been raised by some of the people who are going to testify today. All right. Uh, we're going to begin now. Um, this hearing will examine the state of the city's jointly operated playgrounds, how we can expand the use of playgrounds for more of the city's children, and how we can protect jointly operated playgrounds in the long term from being lost or inappropriately converted into non-recreational spaces. I want all who have come today to be able to engage in a productive discussion on this important topic, and I expect that questions relating to the joint operated playground or JLP program, playgrounds in general, and how we can protect them in the future, uh, that's what should be addressed today. I and my colleagues will be asking qu questions that are relevant to this topic, and we expect responsive answers so that we may fulfill the Council's role of conducting proper oversight and is the administration's duty uh, to comply with this oversight role, as they often do, not always, but often. Uh, but now to the issue at hand. Um, JLPs were first created in the 1930s out of a partnership between the Parks Department and the Board of Education in order to expand recreational space to more New Yorkers in areas of the city where such space was lacking. The goal was to provide recreational space for school children who attended schools where the playground was located during school hours and then open up the playground to the rest of the community after school hours and on weekends. A joint effort to build and run the playgrounds occurred, with the Board of Education financing the acquisition of the sites while the Parks Department paid for the maintenance and the operation of those sites. Today there are almost 270 JLPs throughout each of the five boroughs and they are still run as a partnership between the Department of Parks and Recreation and what is now known as the DOE, the Department of Education. They are particularly concentrated in neighborhoods that are otherwise lacking in available recreation space. Partnerships to increase open space, such as the Schoolyards to Playgrounds Initiative, which is an offshoot of the JLP program, have a longstanding history in our city and continue to benefit New Yorkers. The initiative started in 2007 with a $111 million capital investment uh, from then Mayor Bloomberg's administration. The city, in conjunction with the nonprofit organization, the Trust for Public Land, targeted certain Department of Education schoolyards in order to transform them into more vibrant parks and make them open and accessible to the community at large. Playgrounds that are part of this initiative are chosen based on whether the neighborhoods in which they are located have a high population density, a population that is projected to grow, limited existing play or open space, and a lack of other vacant land that can be developed into a new park or playground. Once complete, the renovated playgrounds are turned over to DOE to maintain and operate. These playgrounds, which had previously been off limits to their respective communities, are now open and accessible to the public on weekdays and after school from dusk and on weekends or days when school is not in session. At least that is the plan. It doesn't always work out that way. But that's the idea. Since the initiative started, 251 of these playgrounds, many of which are GAOPs, have undergone renovation, have been made publicly accessible. That name, number will increase to 261 after 10 more playgrounds uh, were added to the initiative in 2017 
with funding of $24 million, composed of $18.2 million in capital funding from the city and $6 million in community development block grants. While the need to expand the available stock of playgrounds and continually maintain and update them is universally believed to be crucial to enhancing the livability of the city, playgrounds aren't as protected from being lost as some might think. I know that there are specific cases that have concerned some of the parks advocates who are here with us today, my, and I share those concerns, um, which, which they will outline shortly. A noteworthy example is the Marx Brothers Playground in East Harlem, which has been approved as the site of a $1 billion redevelopment, including three schools, a 760-foot multi-use residential and retail tower. Uh, while the Marx Brothers Playground is now subject of litigation, the underlying issues that were brought to light by the proposed development are of concern to me, the committee, and the council, and were among the primary reasons for the selection of today's hearing topic. Without discussing specific locations, I will say by way of introduction that the view that a playground is not parkland is a view that I do not share. The idea that a transfer of a playground to inappropriate uses may happen absent state and city legislation raises flags, at the same, red flags, and at the same time, I understand that if all playgrounds are deemed to be parkland, they may then be protected just as, any, uh, just as much as any other piece of officially mapped parkland would. Such a policy could have long-standing implications for future projects, as a project that sought to remove a playground would have to go through the multiple levels of the alienation process thereby increasing uh, the level of public review. Such a change would have the potential to add a layer of protection to much needed open space, especially as more and more interests in the city continue to jostle, jostle for our limited land resources and how they should be used. I thank the administration and the advocates and the public that are all here today to participate in today's hearing. I look forward to examining how we can develop policies to expand and protect access to playgrounds and open space uh, by all New Yorkers and ch children in particular. And I thank you all. That is my opening statement. Um, the first two people are going to testify representing um, the city's mayoral de Blasio administration are uh, Matt Jury um, from the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and Bill Estelle, who is with the Department of Education School Facilities. I would now ask that um, our council swear them in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have lots and lots of people who have signed in to testify today. Uh, we will get to all of you. Uh, I promise you that. I don't have anything too exciting planned for the rest of the day. So, But uh, people in North Shore Towers, I'm only kidding. Um, but if anybody has not signed up and would like to testify, please uh, see the sergeant at arms. So, um, Mr. Drury, are you going first? I am. Thank you very much. Your Thank testimony, you. please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good Chair afternoon. Gredenchek, uh, members of the Park and Recreation Committee and other council members. Uh, my name is Matt Drury. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Thanks for inviting us to testify today regarding the city's jointly operated playgrounds, also known as JOPs, and the Schoolyards to Playgrounds program. As my colleague from the uh, Department of Education will outline in greater de detail in just a minute, both jointly operated playgrounds and the Schoolyards to Playgrounds program are proof of the city's longstanding commitment to providing vitally important recreational open space for more New Yorkers, regardless of who's chiefly responsible for day-to-day -day maintenance, be it NYC Parks uh, in the case of JOPs, or DOE uh, in regards to schoolyards to playground sites, we have jointly crafted a robust interagency partnership over the past eight decades that has taken these spaces, primarily used by schools during the day, and opened them up to broader ac uh, public access outside of school hours. Uh, this is certainly one of uh, NYC Parks' more notable interagency partnerships, but it's far from the only example. As you might be aware, NYC Parks uh, manages numerous parcels that are in the jurisdiction of other city agencies or within the joint jurisdiction of NYC Parks and another city agency. Uh, the entities that have such a jurisdiction over these properties retain decision-making authority over their use, even though the day-to-day -day management of the properties resides with NYC Parks. Probably the best, uh, most familiar example of this is our Green Streets program, uh, which allows hundreds of public streets, uh, medians, or triangles that are technically under DOT jurisdiction and control. They can be improved with park-like features and then uh, managed and maintained by NYC Parks, subject to DOT's present and future needs. 
Uh, though JOPs are under uh, DOE's uh, jurisdiction and control, NYC Parks is dedicated to providing a very high level of care and attention from our hardworking maintenance and operations staff, uh, resulting in a very extremely uh, positive experience for visitors. We've been equally uh, proud of our partnership in DOE in helping identify potential sites and funding for the Schoolyards to Playgrounds program since its launch in 2007. Uh, so in all, I'm pleased to be here today to offer uh, more background on our long-standing agency partnership, and I will now uh, happy to introduce my colleague from the Department of Education, uh, William Estelle. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Grodencheck and other council members and members of the Parks and Recreation Committee. I am Bill Estelle, Executive Director within the Division of School Facilities at the New York City Department of Education. Thank you for inviting me today to testify regarding the city's jointly operated playgrounds and schoolyards to playgrounds program. The health and well-being of our students, their families, and the greater community is a priority for this administration and the New York City Department of Education. As the largest school system in the nation serving over 1.1 million students, we know that our 1,800 schools are hubs for the community to be active, play, and stay well. The DOE works in partnership with the New York City Parks, whose primary mission is to offer resilient and sustainable parks, public spaces, and recreational amenities for New Yorkers. It serves as steward of over 30,000 acres and oversees nearly 4,500 individual properties ranging from parks and playgrounds to community gardens and green spaces. We are here today to discuss various ways in which our agencies work together to maximize the use of city existing resources specifically the manner in which property adjacent to DOE schools, which primarily serve as educational purpose, can be made available to the general public to provide additional recreational space for New York City residents. This objective has been achieved primarily in two fashions. One is the creation and designation of jointly operated playgrounds, also known as JOPs, where DOE has primary jurisdiction and New York City Parks plays an active role in the day-to-day -day maintenance and operation of the property. The other and more recent inception is the Schoolyards to Playground program, which involves sites that the DOE has both primary jurisdiction and retains responsibility for the maintenance and operation. In both cases, the general public can utilize these spaces outside of school hours, increasing access to much needed open space in neighborhoods all over the city. JOPs and Schoolyards to Playground sites are a vital component of the city's commitment to ensure equity and access to open spaces as many New Yorkers are underserved by open space resources and use these properties to help meet those needs. The jointly operated playground program was created to provide recreational opportunities for public, students, public school students during school hours while allowing access to the public after school hours. Construction of the city's first jointly operated playground was completed in 1941 and hundreds more were established over the ensuing decades. The program was largely inspired by the city's desire to avoid duplication of services to minimize the acquisition cost related to school sites being acquired by the DOE at the time. Under the JOP program, over 260 playgrounds adjacent to schools under the jurisdiction of the DOE are jointly operated by the DOE and the New York City Parks. Broadly speaking, portions of the JOPs are primarily used by the adjacent schools during the day and available for use by the surrounding community during non school hours. Though the details of management arranged between the New York City Parks and DOE may differ according to the needs of the individual school and the local community. These facilities may have athletic fields with large areas for team sports to occur, asphalt areas, and playground space for basketball, shuffleball, volleyball, etc. Areas with playground equipment like slides and climbing apparatus and benches near where recreational activities take place. The primary day-to-day -day responsibility for the management of JOP, including the maintenance, generally falls to the New York City Parks. Most JOPs are marked by the New York City Parks brand signage to notify visitors that the New York City Parks rules are in effect at these sites. Though, specifically, though specific implementation varies at each location, general care of the property is provided by the New York City Parks maintenance staff either by mobile crews or by fixed post staff who report directly to the site and are cleaned five to seven times per week. In addition to daily operations, New York City Parks generally oversees the, the facilitation of major capital improvements for these properties as well, in close coordination with the Department of Education. 
Since the beginning of the de Blasio administration, in partnership with the elected officials and private donors, the city has completed 76 capital projects on JOP sites with another 102 improvement projects underway, representing over $225 million in investments to keep these properties in a good state of repair. 27 of these sites are part of the New York City Parks Signature Equity Effort, the Community Parks Initiative, CPI, which is providing community-guided redesigns and complete reconstructions at sites in underserved communities. In July 2007, as part of the city's Play NYC, the DOE introduced its Schoolyards to Playgrounds program with the goal of converting DOE schoolyards adjacent to elementary and middle schools in communities playgrounds for the use of general public outside of school hours in neighborhoods in need of open space. While many of the initial sites were simply designated and open to the public accordingly, other sites received capital funding to provide necessary upgrades such as new play equipment, greenery, asphalt sports fields. This administration has continued the DOE and the New York City Parks Interagency Partnership by together identifying additional schoolyards to be designated as schoolyards to playgrounds and investing over $12 million to date in capital funding. In total, this administration has announced the opening of 21 schoolyards, of which 14 are open and operational and seven others are currently in design and construction. New York City Parks and School Construction Authority continue to work together on school reconstruction projects and are working to define, define additional schoolyards to join the program. These capital improvements have been delivered with the support from several partners, including the School Construction Authority, New York City Parks, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Trust for Public Land. Since the inception of Schoolyards to Playgrounds, 254 schoolyards, schoolyards have since been designated as playgrounds and opened up more broadly to the public, which helps fulfill the city's goal of bringing 85% of New Yorkers within walking distance of an open space by 2030. In a manner distinct from the shared agency operation of jointly operated playgrounds, the day-to-day -day management and care of schoolyards to playground sites resides fully under the auspice of DOE, but offer a very similar visitor experience as a JOP, active play areas, courts, fields, and seating areas for New Yorkers to enjoy. The combined open space benefit of JOPs and schoolyards to playground sites for the general public is truly remarkable. Close to 850,000 New Yorkers would not live within walking distance of any open space amenity without access to one of these JOPs and schoolyards to playground sites. The DOE and New York City Parks are committed to continuing our partnership to make sure these spaces are kept in good condition and available for New Yorkers everywhere to enjoy open space and recreational opportunities. Thank you for allowing us to testify before you today and for the Council's partnership and support of both DOE and New York City Parks as we work together to educate our city's children and provide fantastic open spaces for all New Yorkers. We would now be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I hope so. Thank you very much. Um, thank you both for your testimony. I greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, I have looked at some of the JOPs and, and uh, in my community and elsewhere in my capacity as a, uh, both a councilman and as a chair of this committee and that maple leaf, I know it's not really a maple leaf, it's like a combination of London plane tree and sugar maple, so. <laughs> but um, that tells me more than anything that a piece of land in the city of New York is a New York City park. And what I'm hearing today and what, you know, what I know from um, working with the committee staff is they're not really, but this has been going on for a very, very long time, and you know, people move, especially people with young children, they move to communities with good schools, with good parks if they can. They try to improve that, and I know my, all my colleagues uh, feel the same way. We, we love to invest money in our parks. Um, so the question to me is, um, and really boils down, when I see that tree leaf, um, it seems to me that these are really parks uh, in everything except name only. And I think it's fair for most people because most people, you know, don't have the time uh, to do the research um, that they would expect that any JOP with, a, with the parks insignia on the parks labeling would be a park. And 
Can you kind of expand on that? I'm going to ask Mr. Jury to answer that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the primary function of, of NYC Park signage, which is absolutely in place at, at many JOPs, is to denote that you know, the property outside of school hours is broadly open and available to the public. It's to signify sort of that it is, for all rights and purposes, open recreational space that's available to the public outside of school hours. Um, and from a more technical sense, to note that agency rules, NYC Park's rules, will be, generally speaking, in effect at those properties. Are there any JOPs that are open to the public outside of school hours? There are, sorry, yes. I so mean, I mean, while school's in session. During school hours. Yes, there are, there are portions of some JOPs that have, you know, sort of maybe toddler, uh, toddler play sets or things like that that are indeed open to the general public during school hours. So they're, they're, those really essentially function as a park, that's what I'm getting at. Sure, as you know, I mean, uh, knowing that this space is open and available you know, to the public was the intention of the creation of the program back in the 1930s and 40s. You know, the notion that though the properties were acquired for school use, and that's its primary, you know, that is and continues to be its primary underlying purpose, um, the notion of trying to make sure that the, these properties, these acquisitions, could have greater value for the public, the broader public, um, is, has absolutely always been the intention. And I know you haven't been in parks for 80 years, but um, can you tell me if any of the JOPs, in your, to your knowledge, the best of your knowledge, or Mr. Estelle, um, mm -hmm. to your knowledge, have any of them ever been transferred and made into New York City parks? I'm not aware of any. I believe the, you know, the underlying jurisdiction for, for those acquisitions and designations have remained as such. Does, my park, does park ha uh, have an official opinion on whether or not some of them might be suitable to become parks property as opposed to Department of Education property? I mean, we think they are excellent spaces that are available to the public and, and enjoyed by a great many, and we relish and enjoy our role in, in keeping them, uh, you know, in, in, as, in the best condition possible in this partnership. But ultimately, you know, the fact that it is under DOE's jurisdiction and, and control is something we're well aware of and comfortable with. Okay, because they, you know, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and the water runs off its back like a duck, it's usually a duck. Sure, but that's, you know, but, and, and ultimately that's sort of the goal, that these spaces would be seamless, you know, to a, to a user. Like, you know, folks would, should, you know, understand that, you know, it doesn't, it, ultimately, if they just want to go and, you know, shoot hoops or uh, sit and rest whatever, or whatever, whatever, whatever it is, whatever like might that experience happen. is sort of immaterial to the, to the, to the visitor. Okay. Um, Mr. Estella, are you aware of any property that has been transferred from DOE to parks in, in your, I don't know how long you've been at DOE, but... Uh, I hate to, I was afraid you were going to ask that I question. Don't, you don't have, you're under oath, remember <laughs> that, so. I've been with the Department of Education in many, many capacities for over 44 years. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you for your service to the city and the children. Thank you. Um, you have, I, I assume this goes back for decades, you have uh, agreements, contracts, memoranda of understanding between the two agencies that, is there one generally, or is there one for each of the 260 some odd. To our understanding, there's actually not one umbrella MOU the way there is for Green Streets or some other arrangements. So it's, uh, there's, you know, sort of broad understandings that were developed through, you know, through policy during the launch of the program. And then there are also, you know, site by site, different needs, different configurations. So there's actually a really close partnership between both agencies, especially at the, the local level, the school's principal, what have you, to sort of, you know, tweak the, you know, the maintenance approach or... So would that be between the principal and, say, Commissioner Marr, or would it be between somebody operating under one of the local commissioners? How would that work? Uh, it's, it dep again, it depends. Each, I think it you know, depends on the circumstances and the issues that, are, that, that arise, but generally speaking, it's a conversation between the local school and, and the borough. That's correct. And um, can you tell me now of the 260 some odd JOPs... Um, uh, how many DPR uh, manages and maintains? Is it all of them? Are there any that those properties don't? are managed sort of as uh, part and parcel of our, our broader maintenance approach? So they they experience the same sort of uh, cleaning treatment from either a mobile crew or in some cases you know fixed or split post crew. So it's sort of from so our maintenance perspective. From your you know, perspective, treated. they're treated as any other park would be treated. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Okay. Um, and do you have the numbers broken down by each borough? I, uh, and if you could just quickly yeah. go through no, how many there are in each borough. and Roughly. Roughly. I won't uh, hold you to it too much. Roughly 44. And this is, again, this is specific to JOPs, jointly right. operated playgrounds, mm -hmm. not the schoolyards playground program. Mm -hmm. uh, about roughly 263, give or take. 
44 in the Bronx, 86 in Brooklyn, 35 in Manhattan, 82 in Queens, 16 in Staten Island. Yeah, I have a lot in my district. Um, permitting for these sites, I know um, uh, that's important, and I, I just wondered, is that done by your agency, or is it done by EO, DOE? or Special event permitting is handled by the borough permit office for these spaces. So that's, the, to be specific, the Parks Borough Permitting Yes, office. I'm sorry, okay. yes, the NYC Parks Borough Office. And... Um, when it time to inspect a park, I know you you inspect them, and, uh, commissioners inspect them, and other people inspect them. Uh, is that done by by your agency alone, Mr. Jury, or is it also done in conjunction with the principal, or how does that work? Uh, I, you know, it may be the case that principals are kept apprised of you know inspection results, which are public information, uh, or you know as part of the conversation. But generally speaking, those are those inspections are conducted by 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 the agent, by parks agency staff. And. Just to go back a little to the the uh, how they, they're operated, would you say in your um, your understanding of how things work that there are frequent contacts between Parks and DOE, or is Parks kind of allowed to pretty much do what they want within the understanding that this is also uh, DOE property? Uh, on a day-to-day -day sense. Uh, I would say there's, there's, you know, it's probably not a great degree of top level, man, you know, managerial, uh, you know, administrative side uh, contact, but you know, but I think there's a great degree of contact, you know, sort of on the on, on the ground between local staff on at both the school and in our borough offices. Um, this is just to to pick up on, um, I guess, just some of the rules. The, the um, obviously Parks has its own rules and. DOE has its own rules for, for uh, both park prop, for the property that you maintain. And I know now uh, Commissioner Silver's testimony previously were over 30,000 acres, which is great. Um, do your rules apply at JOPs or do DOE's rules apply? And either of you gentlemen can answer that question. I know that parks agency rules are in effect at jointly operated playgrounds. It may, and I'd ha I think we'd have to check to see if maybe there are sort of underpinning that if there are broader uh, DOE rules sort of writ large that would also apply, um, but turning the schoolyards to playgrounds, that would be under the rule structure entirely of DOE. Is that your experience, uh, Mr. Stelman? Uh, are you referring to JOPs or schoolyards to playgrounds? Um, both. So it all JOPs is really the subject yeah. here, but you know. So JOPs, as my colleague was just saying, they basically do all the operation and maintenance. What I do want to add to it, the custodians are on site, and many of these JOPs, the administration, school administration, use it for lineup and also recess. So we ensure that there are no hazards out there, such as broken glass, any damaged fence. So the custodian does monitor that, and in many cases, assist the, depart the parks department in maintaining it. It's a collaborative agreement and working relationship that we have with parks on that. But we do inspect them on a daily basis. And um, do PEP officers ever patrol the JOPs, uh, park, <coughs> park enforcement patrol? Um, they do, yeah. Uh, in short, uh, they, they are part of mobile patrols, or if there's a response for a 311 or other type call, they're, they're, they're cer it's certainly part of their sort of uh, bailiwick. Would, would most of my schools, I have one uh, school uh, safety, safety officer, which is generally fine. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, do you want to say something Yeah, no, else it's an that? important clarification. Uh, PEP officers are certainly available during school hours to assist as needed. That's generally speaking more of a sort of on-call situation. You know, someone not, if, 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 the, if a portion of the property is not open to the general public and yet someone's trying to get in, that sort of thing, we're certainly on call. During school hours, yeah, those issues are normally sort of handled by, by school safety school and safety other individuals. That's a, that's a good clarification. Okay. All right. Um, and um, does Department of Recreation, uh, Parks and Recreation, or DOE keep any statistics on um, criminal activity? Or do you leave that to the police department? Who's in, who, uh, who would know that information? Uh, These are a JOP. Yeah, for sort of criminal activity, criminal summons, PD would be the best source. I'd, I'd have, you know, I, 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 I presume we could get access to that, those types of numbers. Okay. Um, and regarding the schoolyards to playground initiative, are there any current plans to add more 
playgrounds to be covered under this initiative? I know you did mention some um, in your testimony, but I just wondered, going forward, are we planning um, on adding to what has been a successful program? Yeah, I can answer that. So currently we have about uh, 252. I believe we added 14 under this administration, and I believe there is about seven or eight that are currently under construction to be opened up in the next couple of years. And I think the Department of Education and, and also New York City is always looking to expand that program. It has been an extremely successful program. The ones that are under construction now, is that parks, is it SCA? And I know Trust for Public Land has also worked on, on some of the, at least they're working on one of my schoolyards right that's, now. That's correct. Uh, I think there are, mm, of the several, it's, it's uh, parks are handling overseeing the capital project in one or two instances. Uh, SCA is handling an additional three or four, and then I believe uh, Trust for Public Land has helped provided funding, but I think those projects will be overseen by SCA. Okay. Uh, I've got some more questions for you, but I have very patient colleagues that uh, I don't want to keep waiting forever. And uh, right now we have questions from um, two of my colleagues, and if any of you would like, others would like to ask questions, you're certainly welcome. Uh, the first one will be uh, uh, Ben Kalos from Manhattan. C Councilman. Thank you, Chair Gavemchik, for your uh, oversight of this uh, issue, which is near and dear to my district. Uh, for folks who are uh, just catching up on this, what is the big difference between a playground and a park, uh, specifically with regards to alienation uh, or uh, sorry, in, in English it would be to, to selling it or giving it to somebody to put up a building or some other use. What, what is the big difference between a playground and a park for that purpose? Does one have different protections than the other? I, I mean, I think, so there's a couple different ways to sort of parse this question. Um, I, you know, as a legal concept, you know, dedicated parkland is a very, you know, sort of unique and has a very unique and specific definition. So using terms, frankly, like park or playground, you know, can, can get a little confusing. So I, I guess I'm, I don't know if with that in mind, do you want to Is the clarify? process for the city giving land to a developer or another third party different for a piece of land that is classified as a park versus classified as a playground? Yeah, I get, uh, there is a process in place where if uh, a property is dedicated parkland, like legally, you know, as legally defined, uh, then that has to be alienated by, by via state authorization <coughs> for that alienation. I think that's your question. But a playground does not need state authorization. A play, yeah, we're conflating terms here. A playground can be dedicated parkland or it cannot. A playground that is not a dedicated park. <coughs> Correct, then if it's not dedicated parkland, it would not need to be formally alienated and, and but via state authorization. Do you know and so Marx Brothers Playground was not, in your opinion, designated parkland? Yeah, so as I think folks are aware and as has been discussed, like, we're, we're not here to discuss, like, okay. the, it's under active litigation, so we're not going to so discuss because of that, you specific can't stuff. comment whether or not there, or, or why there was an, a state action on something that the city did not believe may have been a parkland, so you yeah. can't comment on that. Well, we're absolutely happy to share the papers, uh, you know, the municipal res uh, respondents memorandum of law, which was joined by the city council. We're happy to share that for you. Perfect. So then the, the next piece is uh, where, d you mentioned the numbers of locations, but currently for the jointly operated playgrounds, is there currently a map or an open data set, or are they just listed with everything else as a park? So. For, for instance, it is a distinction that's made. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it is a distinction that's made internally for certainly for our maintenance efforts. We have a sort of a property class jointly operated playground, and that's tracked. And I believe that would be available on the open data set, I presume. If you can send that over or sure. make sure it gets uh, put up there. Uh, I guess the, the next piece is are there any additional jointly operated playgrounds that are currently? Uh, being considered or negotiation or, or that parks or the city hall has been approached about for being converted for a use as other than a park? Pardon me. There are some properties that are being considered, 
property under the school's uh, school DOE's jurisdiction and control, there are some JOPs that are under consideration for school expansion, things of that type, where the footprint might, you know, uh, cut into the sort of JOP's footprint. There are several, I think there are three or four of those sort of under consideration right now. For, you know, for non-school use, I'm not aware of any proposals. Uh, DOE, if you can share which schools, and can you also answer the question of whether or not any current JOPs that DOE also has jurisdiction over are currently being considered for non-education uses? And that, inc that, that would be anything, including housing that might benefit an educational institution. Me personally, I'm unaware of anything. I am aware, as my colleague mentioned, that there are four sites that are currently being reviewed, but it would be for school use. We had a, a situation in the council where a nursing home was converted into uh, luxury condos. We created a process around that. Uh, what is the process moving forward? Should there ever be another jointly operated playground or other space operated by the parks department that does not have the full protections of parkland requiring a state action? If, if property that was acquired for school slash playground use, which is sort of the class we're discussing here, mm -hmm. uh, if there is a proposed use that is not uh, within those bounds, it would have to go through the, it would go through a land use item at, uh, and, and be approved through that normal, through that normal ULER process. And, and just, okay, so if we have a jointly operated playground, how much of that playground can be licensed or franchised to somebody? So, so currently, if somebody wants to play kickball, they can do a kickball league. There's an entire company, one of them in particular is like Zog Sports. I only know it because I see the shirts. So people can use those spaces privately, kick the kids off, which happens at Samuel Seabury Playground in my district, which the kids are very unhappy about. So uh, what are the jointly operated playgrounds available to private companies uh, in any way, shape, or form. I think what you're discussing are our, those are athletic permits that are issued to a variety of leagues. You know, some I guess you're referring to as private. Others are, you know, I guess community based. Is that the distinction being made here? But yeah, those. Yeah. So that's all done within the athletic permit uh, process through our offices. And that's for an hour at a time. And I, I will do one last question. I uh, generally, they're about yeah about an hour. It depends on the sport. Depends on the use. Yeah. You know, but one to two hours, I suppose. Uh, and and so I guess. What would be the distinction between, so I have a playground in my district too, it's called the Queensboro Oval, it was so designated by the Board of Estimate, uh, and so what that, that is actually alienated now year round uh, through a franchise, I guess, how is that piece different, uh, and how do, we, how do you distinguish between giving a piece of land over permanently versus, <laughs> or, or on a 99 year lease versus on a 40 year lease? Well, similar, to uh, JOPs, Queensboro Oval is, n is not dedicated parkland either, so it can't be alienated in, in, that, in, the, in the legal sense. Um, however, on uh, parks can engage uh, in concessions, you know, where uh, to activate space in partnership, in this case, with Cupo Queensboro Oval with DOT, which has the underlying jurisdiction and control. And are there any other, for JOPs, places where there's a concession that exceeds several hours to months or, or years? I'm, I'm not aware of any concessions okay. on JOPs at all, frankly. And, and I, I would just like to echo the, the comment of our uh, parks chair here. Uh, I won't use the, uh, the, the, the duck analogy. I will use the dead parrot analogy from uh, Monty Python, uh, which is uh, it's, it's, it's a dead parrot. And, and I guess you, you may see something different, but a, a park is a park. Uh, and uh, we, we can argue all, all we want, and, and I think just to, to be clear, uh, with the investments that park is make, Parks Department is making, in order for them to be capitally eligible, should there not be a requirement that at least these parks can't be alienated for five years? Uh, you keep using the word alienate, and it's, it has a specific legal term, so I mean, uh, can you, you wanna <laughs> clarify your question? If the city is investing in, this is my, my fi final question. Final, final, question. final, final. If the city is investing capital dollars, uh, which is money from our budget, from the taxpayer dollars, into a park, uh, capital money has a restriction that it has to be there for five years. Uh, would the 
Parks Department to admit that any of these GO JOPs or playgrounds that may not be operated with DOE might be operated with DOT in my district uh, should not be eligible for uh, lease licensure or otherwise sale or use by somebody for non-public purposes that are <coughs> free. The Mayor's Office of Management and Budget defines capital eligibility as being dedicated towards work that will be expected to have at least a five years expected life. That's that's not just you know unique to parks. That's that's you know I think that's true of citywide capital expenditures writ large. Uh, Councilman, I'll be happy to come back to you in the second round if you'd like. If you'd like, okay. Um, with regard to the ornithological references, uh, I never want to be a dead duck or a dead parrot, but I appreciate your uh, your reference there. Uh, Councilman Powers, please. Thank you. Thanks so much. I have no Mon Monty Python uh, analogies or so forth. Um, just let, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the definition of alienation does have a specific definition, and it's related to parks and specifically lays out the, pro the, the process by which um, one can alienate parks. So let me just pick up where he left off and maybe try to be more specific in, in the approach. The 260 JOPs and I don't know how many schools and playgrounds there are. About the same. About, about the same. same. Okay, so 520, yeah. let's just use the number 500. Yeah. Do any of those require alienation if you wanted to? Do any require alienation? Those are all properties that were acquired primarily for school usage. So they're all under the underlying jurisdiction and control of DOE. As such, they are not. not no they alienation. are not dedicated parkland and okay. would not have to undergo alienation. Got it. And for the Morks Brothers Park, I know that's under litigation, but I want to say that did have a home rule for that. Is that correct? And can you explain why that one had a home rule versus? I, I can acknowledge it did, you know, mm -hmm. undergo the, the alienation process for a variety of reasons, but I can't really speak to the, it's, you know, that's now sort of part and parcel of the, was now undergoing litigation, so got it. We're not really and if discussion. is there a process by which, if there was a joint operated park or schools and playground that wanted to transfer control over from uh, DOE to D department, what is the process for transferring authority? Uh, it essentially, yeah, I propose. It, I guess it would be sort of like any interagency transfer. Uh, you know, I, I'm not. A, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a land use expert, but I. You know, I believe there is a process in place to kind of go through, you know, go through ULERP and map something as parkland. I suppose right. that's something the city. And has, do you have an, any understanding of that's a process that's been looked at or? or no, I, don't, I believe that, you know, the JOPs as, as a property class have, have basically sort of existed in that set, generally speaking, since the 1940s. Got it. And I just wanted to go through, you mentioned DOE jurisdiction and control were the words that were used. So I just want to go through a couple of things that the, the chair did a good job of sort of going through some of the categories, but maintenance is Department of Public, maintenance for the JOPs, parks, or DOE? For JOPs, yeah. maintenance, day to day maintenance is yeah. generally handled by parks, although we do have some partnership in many. In okay, instances. permitting? Permitting, parks. Okay, these are ones he's covering. I'm just going back to yeah, inspecting. Uh, inspections are handled by parks. Okay, rules governed by parks. Correct. Um, who sets closing hours? Uh, parks in, in coordination with the local school. When we designate capital funding, does it go to DOE or to parks? Generally speaking, a capital project at a JOP is handled by parks. Parks. I could probably keep going through categories. Yeah. Parks, parks, parks. I mean, it, sure. my, my point being, and I'm asking the alienation question and the control question for reasons I'd better understand that, because there are specific things about alienation. I think there is, I'm not familiar with what the process is, but I think there is a process for doing, looking at them and looking at authority and so forth. But you guys are essentially running these spaces, whether we call them, whether the colloquial terms of parks or playgrounds are used or the legal definition between them. And I think that the concern that many folks have, my councilman Kalos, many here in the community, is that they are essentially used as parks by whatever familiar definition we use. They're operated that way. They seem to be funded that way. And in fact, the concern is that they don't get treated that way under the law, and perhaps we should be looking at whether transferring authority or looking at the alienation law. I, I, I just a couple of, that was my statement, but I got some follow-up questions, is do they have developmental rights, the JOPs? Parks, I believe, don't have developmental rights. Can you take developmental rights off them and use them for air rights? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm afraid I can't speak to that. Yeah, I can't. Does anybody have the answer from parks? We can 
we can look more into that and I apologize. Because that would be another reason to think about, you know, what is the impact on surrounding community, particularly one of the most famous locations we're talking about is a development site, and I think that's a primary concern here. Um, the, uh, there's, so there's 260 schools. That, so can you just describe, describe again the difference between the joint operated parks and the schools and playgrounds? Sure, absolutely. So both are es essentially properties, city property, under the control and jurisdiction of, of DOE. In one case, historically, back in the 1940s, a class were created. Normally, when these properties were actually acquired for schools, a subset of those plots, if you will, were set aside for, for broader public access. Those are JOPs. Parks plays a day-to-day -day maintenance role in those. The spirit of that endeavor was carried through in 2007 when Schoolyards to Playgrounds launched. That essentially sort of feels and looks the same, except that Parks plays less, uh, doesn't play a day-to-day -day operational role, though we have, we are very supportive in, in some cases, overseeing some of the capital work that happens at those sites, or providing funding, or, and essentially providing input as to potential additions or expansions. We, pro we help provide that guidance and uh, expertise. Got it. And I just want to clarify, n there's no answer uh, from any of the folks on your side about the developmental part of it, were they right? No, we'll have to get that Can we follow up? Yeah, on that. Absolutely. And, um, and the DOT site that my colleague mentioned, that is the Oval, which you're very familiar with, um, is that a JOP then? Because it's a joint, it's not a DOE, but it's a, it's a joint, it's a, you guys are like, it's a- Internally, for, yeah, internally for our maintenance needs, in all, in all practicality, it's actually essentially, I believe it's characterized essentially as a concession because for most, the bulk of the year, there's a bubble on site and the actual vendor cares for the space. So I don't know that it has a, it's, it is not a JOP, I can speak to that, but I don't know how else it might be categorized. And having expressed a little of my opinion and asked a couple of questions, I just want to maybe ask a final question here, which is have, would, what are the challenges or, or the considerations for Department of Parks and DOE, since you're both here and, and, and other agencies that might be play a role in this, School Construction Authority, if you were to transfer authority over, if you were to, or to redefine them so that they are parks. And of course, in the one of the examples we're talking about, it did get a home rule, it did get, it did get passed by the legislature, so that doesn't mean that that doesn't have a process, but certainly when we, the reason those processes are in place is to have a public review process for mm -hmm. changing those properties, the usage of those properties. What are the challenges if you wanted to go through the process of, because it, because it, with all the things we've said, it behooves us to not sure. be thinking that they should just be parks. I, I'll, I'll yeah. leave this to Bill to mostly speak to, but I, I would think it would be the, the potential loss of flexibility for, for the Department of Education to expand as needed to sort of use this property as best, you know, to, to educate our kids and serve three that three examples that purpose. are using, and then for school expansion right now, you mentioned that would be one. Okay, what are the other ones? So, so yeah. just want to make a statement. The primary use, whether it's a uh, schoolyard, to playground, or it's a JOP, is primarily for the school. It's for school use, it's used during recess, and if it's in an overcrowded district where there's a desperate need for seats, they do look at JOPs and they do look at schoolyards to uh, playgrounds. They look at these sites to you know, accommodate the uh, additional seats that are greatly needed in a lot of our areas throughout New York City. Got it, so that's the challenge, is about flexibility. Yeah. and. And okay, um, and but although those theoretically you could have still have some transfer of authority with some flexibility to be able to expand, but it, it gets concerns about alienation and things like that. Okay, thank you. I may have a second round, but I'll hold up. Okay, I think when we want to dedicate parkland, regardless, we'll still have to undergo ULIP. So, uh, Andrew Cohn from the Bronx, Councilman Cohn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, I, I have to say though, I, I am uh, disconcerted about uh, about the status of some what I thought were parks, that I used as parks, that I brought my daughter to as a park that's not really, as, that I've invested council capital money in that is not a park. Uh, and, I feel, uh, and I only learned that in the last uh, week or two. So I, I have to say I'm very surprised and I am a little concerned uh, that uh, you know, the alienation process exists for a reason. It's not insurmountable, it does happen. Uh, but that I have park, like you know, Dinmont Park, and Vinmon Park is, there may be portions of Vinmon Park that are used by the school during the day, but a substantial part of it is not. It is open to the community 24 hours a day, and it's a JOP. Uh, spite and diet, I mean, if you tried to, if we wanted to, I have a crowding problem at the school adjacent to Spite and Dial, but if we tried to build a school in there, uh, there would be a, a revolt. Like, uh, but these properties are not really protected uh, in, 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 as fully as, as 
parkland, as designated parkland. Uh, I think that that is, uh, should be of real concern to everybody. I mean, and again, we're not saying there aren't instances where alienation makes sense, but to have this sort of, uh, it's really a misrepresentation to the community that they think that they have a park, and they really don't. They don't have the full protections of parks department property. Uh, I, I, I find that v uh, very disconcerting. I think I do want to follow up a little bit on uh, Councilman Powers' questions. I, a park does not have, is not zoned for development. There's no, deve there's no air rights in a park. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I apologize. That speaks to sort of the, I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, uniquely conversant in the, in the sort of air rights. That's issue. my understanding. However, uh, that may not be true in uh, a, jointly, a jointly operated playground. You can go build your school. If you want to expand the school into the jointly operated playground, it could conceivably be zoned for that or could have air rights. I, I can't speak to that either. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, Mr. Chair, I am uh, very much more concerned than when I, uh, when I was a little while ago learning about the staff. I mean, really, core parks. The Wakefield Playground is the only playground in the entire area there, and that it doesn't have all the protections of the park. Uh, I share your concern, uh, Councilman Cohn, and... Um, we may have to do something about it. I'm not sure I asked any questions other than ranting. But <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's what I'm here for. Uh, Mr. Jonah, I am sorry I skipped over you. We've been joined also by Councilman Van Bramer, um, uh, Councilman Jonah uh, from the great borough of my birth, the Bronx. Uh, thank you, Chairman, but you often skip over the borough of the Bronx, which is understandable. Uh, can I, you I don't think it's understandable. <laughs> Go Can ahead. you please elaborate on the J the number of JLPs again? I heard 261 and the breakdown was 44 Bronx. Can you repeat them again? I know if we can ask the same sure, question for school to no, play no school problem yards to playgrounds. Uh, 263 mm -hmm. total, uh, 44 in the Bronx, 86 in Brooklyn, Manhattan, 35, uh, 82 in Queens, Staten Island, 16. And for school yards to playgrounds? The Bronx, 35. Uh, the total is 254? Correct. 252. Bro I mean, 252. It's, it varies. Uh, the Bronx, 35. Brooklyn, 97. Manhattan, 18. Queens, 73. And Staten Island, 29. And I believe the dollar amount that you implemented of 225 million. Can we get a breakdown of that 225? Uh, for JLP work, I don't have that breakdown currently, but we can certainly get that to you. And the same, same for yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. I echo the same concerns of my colleagues that we can lose our parks, thinking that they were protected uh, from alienation, um, that overnight a rezoning or a master plan of some sort can alleviate the much needed and used playgrounds that we've become so accustomed to having. I think important context here is, is, is the sort of historical of how these properties were acquired in the first place. You know, they were acquired by DOE for school, often construction, and it was made, you know, these portions of these properties were essentially cordoned off back in the 1930s and 40s and made available to the product, to the, to the public more broadly. But at the end of the day, the acquisitions, the property, was always primarily for school use, and that continues to this day. So that's always been the spirit. So I, I think I, we understand and we're actually frankly flattered that people have become attached to many of these properties. But we need to remember that the underlying the whole reason the property exists in the first place and is in the city's hands was for school purposes. Well, I just want to pick up on something he said, uh, Councilman. Um, it's been in the city's hands. It's just a different part of the city, but you could certainly understand our concern that properties that have the parks logo um, and are operated by parks and are funded through parks might actually be perceived as parks. So, Mr. Joe Nye, please continue. Thank you, Chairman, for that elaboration. Under the JOPs, do any of the sports fields that are currently in larger parkland areas fall under that same definition? I, there are some JOPs that include athletic facilities, courts, fields. Um, but like so Pelham Bay Park, for example. Uh, Pelham Bay Park, as I understand it, is, it would not be considered a JOP. It's, it's sort of a more conventional park. You're certain of that? 
Ex yeah. Although I think there are some fields that have exclusive use to some of our schools. Uh, I mean, we the, certainly have arrangements where now we're t you know in conventional dedicated parkland where there are athletic fields. There are athletic. There's an athletic permit process where use for that field is a, you know granted at various times to various organizations. You know, exclusive use is by permit. Um, that's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. I do uh, also encourage that in the um, upcoming months we have a hearing on alienating parklands that have been used for sports and activities in our parks for open green space versus the traditional use of activities. Uh, in particular, Chairman, um, it was just brought to my attention this past week, the Warriors Football League as well as uh, a soccer league that used Pelham Bay Park for more than 20 years for their activities has been taken away from them because someone's deemed it more important that we have a great lawn that will be fe that has been fenced in and will be cordoned off from sports activities for the three or four events that are had each year. And that's quite disturbing when we are consistently um, portraying our parks as places for children to play uh, healthy sports such as soccer and football and other, when we lack the fields that can accommodate their needs. Um, it's quite disturbing. A 20 year use has just been taken away by fencing. All right, we will we'll talk about that offline. Um, we've been joined uh, as well by Councilman Joseph Borelli from Staten Island. Um, I have some more questions um, for you two gentlemen. And um, just deciding which one to start with. Let's go back to Marx Brothers. Um, uh, regarding that specific uh, joint operated playground, uh, should State Commissioner uh, Rose Harvey determine that it is in fact a park uh, requiring alienation, how would that affect the proposed development? Yeah, I can't speak to the to the to the details of that. Again, that the, the governor's you know authorization, whether it exists or not, whether it's in effect or not, uh, are all part and uh, part and parcel of that active litigation. So I can't speak to that. Yeah, right. You may have some more questions that I can't ask, but I, I did want to put them out. Um, um, what role did the Department of Parks and Recreation play in determining how the acre for acre replacement land for Marx Bros Playground was chosen? Did you have a role? Can you answer? When it, I can speak broadly to JOPs and let's use maybe a school expansion, like you know, a, a more conventional purpose, okay. let's just say. Uh, when that happens, there is absolutely a dialogue between DOE. Right. When they identify that need, we're absolutely a part of, uh, Parks is absolutely a part of that conversation to make sure that if indeed an expansion into, into the JOP footprint is, is necessary, there's absolutely a discussion about whether that will be disruptive. If so, can you know, how can design elements be, you know, you know, is there maybe you know, ways to improve the rest of the property to essentially mitigate for that. You know, there's sort of an internal effort to at least make sure that that's advised. Because, you know, again, at the end of the day, this is, all of this is an effort to make sure that the broader public can enjoy these properties, whether it's whether it's a JOP or whether it's schoolyards property, uh, the playgrounds, you know. Ultimately, these are the two agencies working together that are taking property that was designated for, for one specific use and making sure that we can get the most out of it. Okay. Um, so we don't know whether or not Parks had a had a uh, role in determining how the replacement land for Marx Bros Playground was chosen. Can you answer that? I can say that, broadly speaking, whenever there is a, a design that impacts a JOP, you know, we're a part of the conversation in terms of reviewing what that would look like, certainly. Okay. Um, will the proposed replacement land in Parks Department's uh, opinion be a sufficient replacement for the Marx Bros Playground? I can't speak to as to how we feel whether that's sufficient or not. My understanding is that it's you know square you know it's acre to acre an exact replacement. Can you speak to what features the replacement park land will have? I'm not familiar with the design. Okay, um, since the area is expected to become more dense because we're going to put a 70-story tower on it, uh, should the development proceed, isn't it likely that the replacement park land will be more densely utilized when compared to the current park land? And is that a problem if you have more people uh, utilizing a replacement park of the same size um, as the original? I think some of these dynamics are included in, in, in many of the affidavits and other materials, so I don't know that I can speak to that. Okay. Um, were there any plans to your knowledge to consider a replacement park even bigger than the original, specifically to accommodate for the fact that the new park will be more densely utilized? 
wasn't familiar with the process, and, and nor do I think it would be a, uh, appropriate to answer. Okay. Um, let's walk away from that a little. Can you talk a little bit about how JLPs have been factored into the Community Parks Initiative? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as part of the capital investment that has been provided by you know the mayor, borough presidents, many council members, uh, the Community Parks Initiative is a great example of the types of improvements that we're bringing to uh, playgrounds all over the city. Uh, and so I believe there are Twenty-seven sites that are uh, underway uh, that are categorized as JOPs for those those uh, community-driven improvements. It's a lot of, a lot of sites. Mm -hmm. Would you describe, in your opinion, that using these sites uh, as part of the community parks initiative um, would suggest maybe a permanent permanency to those sites as parkland? Or? I can say the DOE is very, been, is very involved and will continue to be very involved in any capital work that happens at JOPs. Everyone, we all recognize that at the end of the day, these are, this is uh, property that's under DOE's jurisdiction and control and was initially acquired for school purposes. Okay. Um, section 12-10 of the zoning resolution defines a quote unquote public park as being any publicly owned park, playground, beach, parkway, or roadway within the jurisdiction and control of the commissioner of parks. Uh, why is it that some have argued that playgrounds are not technically parks? We heard that before, but um, this would seem to indicate that playgrounds, including JOPs, are in the same categories as traditional parks, at least some people feel that way. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, yeah, I don't really feel comfortable characterizing what some people may or may not okay. feel. Um, I think I've gone over the playgrounds um, on that, and right now I think I um, have asked all the questions I want to ask for now. Uh, we are going to be hearing from at least 12 people who love their parks and are advocates of parks, so I would ask that both of you gentlemen uh, stick around uh, in case I want to ask some questions of you that may be raised by the people that are going to testify this afternoon. Um, for now, though, uh, you are dismissed. Anybody want to, uh, no, I guess not. All right. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, with that, we will have our first panel, um, and that will consist of Carter Strickland from the Trust for Public Land, Lynn Kelly, uh, Director of New Yorkers for Parks, and Elizabeth Goldstein of the Municipal Arts Society. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. Um, I called Mr. Strickland first, but I'll leave it up to you three to decide who's going to test. I think I'm the designated hitter. Okay, first. you're the designated <laughs> hitter. Thank you, Ms. Goldstein. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Goldstein, and I'm the president yeah. of the Municipal Arts One Society. One second. Do we have copies of their testimony? Okay. Thank you very much. Could you just wait, because I, like I like to read along. Okay, go ahead, thank you. Um, I am the president of the Municipal Arts Society and I realized I have been remiss in my written testimony to not tell you that I also served as the director of planning for the New York City Parks Department in the late 80s. I knew that. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I provided you with more comprehensive uh, written testimony. Um, however, in my remarks today, I would like to focus on the relationship between the threat of Marx Brothers Playground in East Harlem and JOPs citywide. And I've brought with me 362 letters from constituents of yours and other uh, city council members um, who've all spoken out about this issue uh, about protecting JOPs. Balanced communities with adequate schools, housing, parks, and other public amenities are what makes New York City strong. And MAS rejects any implication that neighborhoods must choose schools over parks or parks over housing. A recent development initiated and approved by the city at Marx Brothers Playground in East Harlem sets a da dangerous precedent for JOP citywide. MAS with other prominent civic organizations have filed a lawsuit to challenge the city's actions which have effectively allocated development rights to Marx Brothers Playground, a public park, for the purpose of contributing them to the development of a private developer's 700-foot residential tower. MAS believes that both the process and the substance of the city's determination were fatally flawed for multiple reasons. The first is that the city's decision to assign development rights to a park is illegal and unprecedented. Parks do not have development rights, and Marx Brothers Playground should not be an exception to the long city standing policy. Second, the city has offered replacement open space that is inferior and would be developed for other purposes, could be developed for other purposes at any time. And lastly, the disclosures that the city made throughout the process were at best confusing and at worst deliberately obscured the facts. The city contends that Marx Brothers Playground was never protected parkland. Despite this characterization, they took an alienation action to the state legislature in an abundance of caution. The governor stayed the implementation of the alienation pending a review of the Marx Brothers Playground's parkland status by the Commissioner of New York State Parks. MAS strongly affirms the status of Marx Brothers Playground as implied parkland under the state's definition and therefore demands the rigors of not just the alien alienation process, but a commitment to replace in kind and value, uh, which is clearly not proposed as part of the current development plan. We conducted a risk analysis of properties characterized as JOPs and identified 20 playgrounds that have comparable levels of risk to Marx Brothers Playground. MAS strongly believes that uh, parks and open space are vital to livable communities and neighborhoods. Allowing developers to claim air rights from JOPs challenges the protections that parks should have in New York City. We urge the City Council to ensure that jointly owned uh, operated playgrounds are always treated as implied parkland from a procedural perspective. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goldstein. Ms. Kelly? Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, Councilmember Grudenchik and members of the Parks Committee. My name is Lynn Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks, the citywide advocacy organization for parks and open space. We too believe that the alienation of Marx Brothers Playground has set a very dangerous precedent for New York City parkland, and that it would put at risk the other 267 jointly operate, operated playgrounds throughout New York City. But um, as New York City continues to be more dense um, and become more populated, we know that there's a need for more school seats, affordable housing, and other critical city needs. But we also believe that the provision and protection of public open space must accompany that growth. An equitable, livable city depends upon that balance. The JOP program actually represents 37% of all current New York City parks playgrounds and therefore have become truly essential in many of their neighborhoods, which are in some cases park poor. Many of these JOPs have been in continuous use for decades in communities, generations in fact, and have all outward appearances as city parks. They have signage, parks workers, investments in capital and expense dollars, and management and improvements of these spaces have all been led by the Parks Department. In fact, 26 of the 67 sites that were chosen to receive Community Parks uh, Initiative funding are in fact JOPs. And while the representative from the Department of Education said, and I quote, they're primarily used by schools, I would think that the many community parks advocates that are here that fought for a long time for funding in the cumulative amount of $95 million for CPI funding might feel differently about the importance to their neighborhood and community and that they are equally as shared and equally as important. 
Make no mistake, jointly operated playgrounds are indeed parks. And as such, they are protected by the state's public trust doctrine, making them subject to alienation. You know, there's a reason that alienation of parkland is complicated, it's arduous, and it has many public thresholds. It's designed to protect what's in fact a taking of a critical public asset for other private or public uses. Simply put, we believe that if these JOPs are left legally unprotected, the city, and are you ready for this statistic? Yes, ma'am. 402 fewer acres of playground space. That might not sound like a lot, but that's half the size of Central Park that is at risk at this point in communities where it is valuable more than even twice the size of Central Park. I want to argue, uh, reiterate that New Yorkers for Parks is not arguing against the need for affordable housing, for space for school children, for additional school seats, but we are arguing for a city that aims to be equitable to all its residents that the protection of public space, of parkland in this case, is made in all cases of JOPs. Uh, at a minimum, we would ask that this committee consider that jointly operated playgrounds are always treated as implied parkland under the law and treated as such from a procedural perspective. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Um, Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairperson uh, Grudenchik, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify on this really critical topic of jointly op operated playgrounds in New York City. My name is Carter Strickland. I am the New York State Director of the Trust for Public Land, a national nonprofit organization that creates parks and protects land for people, ensuring healthy, livable communities for generations to come. This is an important moment, obviously, for New Yorkers to learn about and take steps to protect JOPs. Parks and open space provide recreational health and environmental benefits for all New Yorkers. The Trust for Public Land in New York has protected over 100 community gardens and created over 200 parks and playgrounds that are within a 10-minute walk of over 3.9 million New Yorkers, including the transformation of over 150 acres of barren asphalt school lots into green infrastructure playgrounds that are open to the general public. Close-by parks are critical because those are the parks that people will use on a frequent basis. For example, when people live near parks, they're more likely to engage in physical activity, a critical step for preventing or mitigating diabetes, obesity, and depression, all of which are on the rise according to New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Nearby parks also allow residents to meet their neighbors, creating two communities and improving mental health and social resiliency according to the Center for, uh, Centers for Disease Control. It's even more critical for our children to have outdoor places to play and get away from their devices. Uh, and their use of parks include, increases by 400% when parks are closer to home. JOPs are the quintessential neighborhood open space that provide benefits to nearby schools and neighbors. The Trust for Public Land collects facts and parks every year for our city fa park facts reports nationwide, uh, and also our park score report uh, for the 100 largest cities in the US. In the past year, New York City's great park system ranked ninth in the country in large part because over 97% of New Yorkers live within a 10 minute walk of a park, over 8.3 million people. Critically, that includes JOPs. If we take away JOPs, the New York City's park access score drops to about 94%. That means that over 220,000 New Yorkers would lack access to a nearby park without a JOP. To put that in perspective, that's more people, that, that would be more people living in a park desert than live in Rochester, Yonkers, Syracuse, or Albany, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth largest cities in New York State, respectively. Whether municipal-owned land is parkland is determined on a case-by-case -case basis under state law. Municipally-owned land is parkland and it does not carry development rights that can be used or transferred. In addition, non-parkland uses or transfer require state alienation legislation, as you pointed out so well. Um, the city's confused the issue here by assigning development rights to, uh, for transfer of Marx Brothers Playground to Tyler developers, which is inconsistent with parkland, but then by going through the alienation process that's necessary for parkland. We can clarify the situation by setting aside the city's actions and claims and looking at the facts and history of the site. That's the appropriate test under state law. As you've pointed out and as we've learned um, uh, through public information, also freedom of information law requests, 
park has a new New York City Parks sign and flag. It's listed on the park's website as a recreational resource. And in my longer written testimony, I provide the citation, as well as in official documents covering properties under the jurisdiction of the New York City Parks, as put forward in this annual report. It's used by sport, sports leagues who are issued recreational permits by New York City Parks. It's maintained by parks personnel, as you've uh, drawn out so well. <laughs> uh, it's frequently inspected by parks personnel. It's been repaired by New York City Parks for over 20 years. And it was considered already by the city alienated parkland when the MTA stored material on a portion of the site for construction of the Second Avenue subway. Any reasonable New Yorker present, presented with these facts would say, that's a park. There are several breakdowns in the process that led to the current proposal for Marx Brothers Playground. And we're worried that left unchecked, these breakdowns would threaten all 268 JOPs in the city. And I think it's telling, by the way, that everybody has a different number for JOPs. We uh, are using 268. That's what we've counted. Um, but there certainly has to be tighter management and control. At a minimum, given the history of JOPs and the facts of their operation, we believe as a policy matter that they should always be treated as implied parkland from a procedural perspective. In addition, we suggest the city council pass legislation that would provide it and the public with timely input on land use decisions affecting JOPs and would afford, uh, inform the final determination of whether a particular JOP is implied, park, is implied parkland. This legislation could include the following elements, an inventory of all JOPs in the city with information about the agencies responsible for operations, maintenance, capital repairs, permitting, and other management duties, as well uh, as a collection of all city, state, and federal funds that have been used at the site, as, as the members of this committee have pointed out quite a Quite a lot of city capital dollars have gone into JOPs. Notice to community boards, council members, borough presidents, school communities, and other interested parties when development is proposed on a JOP or purportedly using JOP air rights. A determination by the city council parks committee uh, that it has to sign off on home rule messages and land use determinations concerning JOPs. And finally, a policy determination that JOPs should not carry transferable air rights. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. Thank you all. Um, I have some questions, and I know um, my colleague, uh, uh, Keith Powers. Uh, Keith, if you'd like to go first, can I ask me? Sorry, and I apologize. apologize. I want to stay to hear the testimony, but I have to, I have, we started late, and I have to run to uh, another event, so I apologize. Um, you guys all, I think, all use the term implied parkland. Can you give me a definition of what that, what that means? Now I can. <laughs> um, so the distinction, there is distinction between uh, the city processes that map parkland and the state policies around parkland. And um, at the state level, alienation is considered an action that needs to be taken when the public has for any length of time accepted a parcel of land as, as use, as being in use as a park. So implied parkland relates to all kinds of parcels of land that are being used for parks for a continual uh, purpose for many years, in excess of 10 years is what case law says, I believe, um, where the, the state recognizes that the public has accepted that as implicit parkland um, and then feels that it needs to take the uh, that piece of land that's going to be alienated in some way or another, its use is going to be converted to something else through an alienation process. And there are certain kinds of requirements uh, that the state imposes which relate to the replacement in kind and in value for the land that is lost. So the reason that this is important is because, and there, are, there is case law all over the state of, of New York where other kinds of parcels in other jurisdictions which were not mapped parkland but were nonetheless alienated, taken for some other reason, needed to go through this alienation process and needed to be replaced in kind and in value. So there's, so to be asked a follow-up question, the, yeah, the, your, your, your belief is that if, or, or state law, says that if it's being used as a park and publicly accept, accepted right. and utilized as a park for a certain period, can the case law says for 10 years that that should be then subject to alienation. That's is correct. that correct? And then alienation is important here to, well, and then that also talks, about, that also dictates dev amount, dev development rights if it's. No, so, um, and let me, let me back up and yeah. clarify this, this portion. When you look at the map for Marx Brothers Playground, there is, there is no, 
development rights, or there weren't until the ULIP actions of last year, there were no development rights on Marx Brothers Playground. None. So there was nothing to transfer. And in fact, all mapped parkland and implicit parkland in New York is, when you look at the zoning map, it has certain kinds of characteristics, which I will not go into at the moment, but delighted to if you'd like to, um, that set it apart and say there's no development or air rights on that particular parcel. What took place here was the city essentially went through a, a, a ULIP action and it assigned development rights to Marx Brothers Playground. And was then that, Ms. Goldstein, was that essentially or it did? It did. Okay. Yeah. And then it transferred those air rights to the, the broader development that was going to go on on the block. So not only is Marx Brothers Playground being relocated to a new location in the block, and we can talk about whether that's, we, I believe, a less advantageous place, but um, for the sake of this discussion, um, it's being replaced acre for acre, but not in value. Got and it. Um, it is also continues to have air rights on it that are unexpected, uh, unexpended even by the development that's being proposed there. There's 300,000 square feet of remaining development rights on the Marx Brothers Playground. If JOPs across the city of New York were to have air rights today, if by some uh, wave of the magic wand, they were to have development rights, they would represent somewhere between 20 and 40 million square feet of development rights that aren't currently on the books, which is 10 Empire State Buildings. Yes, yeah, so of course, with rules about how they can transfer. But the, um, and the second, but the question, my point is that you, you believe that 268, one, or whatever the number is, are implied, meaning that they fall under state law, saying they've been utilized and, and characterized as a park for that period of time. Right, and I, and I want to be absolutely clear that, that when I was the director of parks at, uh, planning at the Parks Department, um, JOPs are a miraculous thing. They are a great thing. And um, the g double use of, of public land is a fabulous thing. But they have, because they were established in, often in the 30s, in the, in the case of Marx Brothers in 1941, they have been accepted by the public and in use as public parkland, implied parkland, for that entire time. Got it. And just two more questions before I go, and I know others have questions. Uh, one of the one of the statements, I think it's Mr. Strickland's testimony, makes the point that there's a confusion around uh, developmental rights um, uh, because they go through the alienation process. Like this particular example, went through the alienation process, although particularly didn't have to. There was a whole moral message, although normally I think the process is. Uh, my view, not having been involved with this at all. That was sort of belts and suspenders on the whole thing. Is that is that similar to your view, or are you making a different point about uh, about the alienation? Yes, I was making a different point. So the point I was making is you can't have both. Um, it's either parkland, uh, and then you go through alienation, but it doesn't have development rights, or it has development rights, and almost by definition it can't be parkland. So you know the city did both here. Um, if they're calling it belts and suspenders, it's not. They I said I called that by the way. I don't know that they are. No, I, I understand. We're using it colloquially. Yeah. We're attributing things to them. If it is a, if it was a belts and suspenders approach, it sounds to me like an admission that it was in fact implied parkland and it should go through that process. Okay, and thank you, thank you for that question. And the last question I had was the comment from the Department of Education and and Department of uh, Parks was that the existing agreement allows them to be. I mean taking their logic, their existing agreement allows for parks to be utilized for the school, and that's their primary purpose, and then uses parks in the era, the hours when they're not being operated by the school. In addition, when there is, there might be reasons that the school, you know, the school, the DOE, would want that school would to be able to do handle overcrowding, school capacity. So if we decide, and I agree with the, one of the comments that was made in the testimony that by all New Yorkers' definitions, this is really a park, and by the prior previous testimony, parks has predominant control over it. But how do we deal with the how do we deal with the need to address overcapacity, school overcrowding? How to uh, address the issue that they're primarily, if you want, if you believe, primarily used as as school uh, school purposes, 
with an outside use or an additional use to that? How do, how do we reconcile those two things if we were to view them as, as appropriately placed in parks? So I think we have a, a more broad issue here in that when open space is planned for in New York City, even as a part of a ULERP process, and I think you know this from having been through ULERP, it's often planned or um, it's like a mitigate maybe as opposed to school seats, sewers, infrastructure as a part of rezonings or uh, land use process. So we would argue that going forward, that open space should be considered upfront as a part of a planning process when there is an opportunity to do so. And in this case, in Marx Brothers, you've had an existing park for what, 60 plus years uh, on a site that because it did not have a mapped parkland status, which is what essentially protects everything under the public trust doctrine. Uh, we believe it's implied parkland, which would also carry the same kind of weight. It was able, frankly, in this case, it didn't come to the Committee of Parks uh, and uh, to your committee for the alienation proceeding for the Home Rule. If we had some of these uh, tighter teeth in place, we'd be able to have a public discourse and a dialogue about planning. Nobody wants to pit one use against the other. That's not what this is about. We know the city needs affordable housing. We know the city needs school seats. We're here to say we need to have a true public dialogue and a true public process when what is very scarce existing open space is right now under threat. Thank you, and I'm sorry I have to leave. I do want to recognize, I see Carnegie Hill neighbors and Civitas, I think some other groups, many looking at my district are doing great you can, work. You can yeah. recognize them next week, but I for now, week, I'd like to- I want to, to thank uh, the chair for having us here. Thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Mr. Powers, and thank you for being with us. Um, even though you're not a member of this committee, but I'm very happy to have you here today. Um, all right, so it's me versus the world now. Um, thank you. <laughs> good luck to the world or good luck to me. Okay, both of us. Um, so question for anybody on the panel. Um, would you say, in your opinion, I don't know if any of you are lawyers, any lawyers? No, one lawyer, okay, one lawyer is enough. Um, would you say that the city of New York has created a precedent here for JOPs, in your opinion? Just asking your opinion as a lawyer and advocate. Can I give my, I'll give my advocate. Opinion. Okay. I hung up my lawyer spurs a long time ago. Um, you know, I do think it is a precedent. I mean, I think if it goes through here, and, and we know how inexorable um, development pressures are in this city, lands at a premium. It's one of the things that makes our city great is our density, but we also need parkland for all the people that are coming here, um, and we can have both. Um, so yes, I do think that the logic of assigning air rights to open space will mean that um, uh, we'll see more pressures in other JOPs throughout the, throughout the city, if that was your question. Well, I, I, I think it is to some extent, but I also think whether you or you, your colleagues here um, feel that it, this is interesting because they didn't, if it's really not parkland, which some people feel, um, then they didn't have to do a ULERP and they didn't have to alienate it, and, but they kind of did that. So, um, and we, my council tells me that we did have a home rule message about this sometime last year. Um, so the question really is, um, and I guess pe different people would differ on this, and I'd be happy to hear from Ms. Kelly or Ms. Goldstein about this, whether or not, you know, was this, was this done, do you think, because it's such a high profile site, whereas something at the end of another part of another borough in the city uh, might not clamor as much attention. I'll, I'll make one comment then hand it over to my colleagues. Um, it was alienated twice, this site. Okay. So I think, uh, you know, uh, over the space of a number of years, it was uh, part of it was alienated where the MTA said we want to use a uh, portion of the site to store construction materials for the Second Avenue subway. Um, under state law, it was appropriate um, if, uh, as parkland for alienation to be That was for sought. public good though. It's for a public good, sure. Uh, you know, but there are um, uh, the mitigation requirements did kick in, and then a second time, which is that concern here. Um, Council member, yes. I would add more broadly that I think we have a, a real mixed message uh, coming from the city about JOPs. You know, very specifically. Uh, in Ms. Kelly, could just make sure you speak into the microphone. 
Is that better? That's better. Okay. So I was going to say, I think the city sent a, a mixed message to the public about how it views JOPs, both in its treatment of Marx Brothers Playground, um, but then also in its very positive investment of JOPs as uh, community parks initiative sites. I mean, to have invested a collective $95 million in these JOP sites is a positive thing. That shows parks. It's a considerable amount of money. It, my my math is correct. It's about 2% of the entire capital budget for the parks department in the next 10 years. And so that's a very positive sign. That's, you know, to me as an advocate, as someone from the public, that's a yay parks thumbs up sign. And that's a uh, affirmation to the communities that have fought for this funding to improve their um, JOPs. But in the case of Marx Brothers, to take the property through an alienation process, which underscore also says it's a park, right? Because you're taking it through alienation, which it did twice. But to not take it to the Committee for Parks as a part of the public process didn't allow, at least for us as advocates, to really flag it as a parks issue, which I think is a really important distinction in the public review process. So. It sends a mixed message, and then to have alienated and then added development rights onto the site in the case of Marx Brothers, which is unprecedented. We, we know for a fact, as planning professionals, parkland does not carry. They, it simply doesn't carry development rights. So city has made an exorbitant investment in JOPs, fantastic. City has, in the case of Marx Brothers, taken it through an alienation, albeit not with the committee that typically would see alienation of parkland, okay. But then now saying that it's going to sign development rights to parkland, unacceptable. And so that's a very mixed message to us as advocates and as a public, and it is something that you are correct that the council should be concerned about. You, Ms. Kelly, you've made clear. Uh, Ms. Goldstein, if you want to comment, go ahead. I'm sorry. I saw you reaching for the microphone. Uh, well, if you, if you want to ask your question. No, I'll, I'll ask it after. Okay. I, I just, I just want to say something that's really important here, and that is to, to talk about the future state of Marx Brothers. Marx Brothers will never be mapped parkland. Um, it cannot be mapped parkland under this scenario because it has development rights on it. And because those development rights have in part been transferred to other parts of the block. Well, that maybe. <laughs> well, maybe, yes. <laughs> yes, from your mouth to God's ears. But um, uh, um, there can never be a situation where this land will be protected as a park in the future because it, it is a tautology. It would undermine the rights that have been given to both private developers and city entities to build what they're going to build on the balance of the block. That future state, the fact that this can never be protected, and in fact is vulnerable to, to development on the site in the future because there's unused development rights that could be, the DOE could partner with the Education Construction Fund next week and decide that it was going to build 300,000 square feet of space on the brand new Marx Brothers Playground the instant after it's built because there is no long-term protection. And that is the flaw in this argument um, that's been made. And that is the thing that brought the Municipal Arts Society to the table, is if you are going to say that these jointly operated playgrounds all over the city of New York are suddenly going to be subject to things that could be transferred to other, you don't have any long-term way to protect them, either as park space or as Classroom no, they're not, space. They're apparently not or, protected right now. So right, or we know that. As yeah. use for students in the schools that are adjacent to them. Um, council member, yes. if I may uh, just ask, because I don't think it came out as a part of the response to the council's questions, but it left a point on me that the Department of Education said that there are four other sites in the pipeline that it may be considering. And I, it might have been Council Member Kalos that said, well, what are the names of those sites? But it wasn't actually, they weren't named as a part of this hearing. And I'm raising that simply because as a matter of just tracking, normally we would go, if this was an alienation, to follow the Parks Committee to say, okay, this is online, we can have a public process. We're now, as a public, we don't even know the names of those four sites to pay attention to them. Well, I think, I, I think um, there is a distinction, in my mind at least, between what would be for a public purpose, um, such as a school uh, or a hospital, um, 
and private development. I think there's definitely a, a clear, and it may have been, and I, I can't go back and talk to those people because they're probably all dead, um, but um, that may have been the original idea that they were reserving this, you know, it was a noble idea, but here we are 80 years later, um, and as I think uh, Councilman Cohn really uh, laid in, um, he was kind of got your, obviously got your letter, uh, Ms. Goldstein, um, that many of our parks are indeed JOPs. So um, it probably would take the connivance of a local member to be able, to, but I'm not sure that would even be the case. Now it is interesting in my mind, and we could talk about this all day, but there are other people waiting to testify, but um, that in fact, on this case, the city felt that it needed to alienate. So it'll be very interesting uh, to see what happens as we go forward, um, to see what Commissioner um, Harvey has to say about this, and to see, um, I'm not gonna talk about the lawsuit, but just in generally to see how that plays out as well. So um, I do thank you. I, I, I do wanna ask one more question. Any of you aware um, of any other JOPs in the last number of years that have been used for other per other than a school um, we know that there was another and and you know I want to be absolutely transparent here so the development that's proposed on the on the block of Marx Brothers includes private development as well as rebuilt public schools okay. so I, I want to be absolutely okay. clear about that um, I think that uh, I know that uh, the Education Construction Fund actually proposed another one of these uh, um, JOPs to be taken on the west side, and that was defeated by the public um, before it ever got to the Euler process. Um, so this is the reason that we, we did our risk analysis, was because we wanted to understand what are the characteristics of, of Marx Brothers that might be the same characteristics for other kinds of JOPs around the city, where the same pressures are underway, and as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, we identified 20 such sites across the city yeah. and in multiple boroughs. So um, we think the characteristics that led to the development proposal and Marx Brothers are not unique. Thank you. Um, I thank you for your advocacy and for your passion, and I don't think we've finished this conversation. Um, I think we'll going to be working on this together for a while. Um, at this time, thank you. and you're dismissed, thank I you thank very you very, very much. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Brett, I, I'm trying, I think it's Dakin, but am I, did I get that right? Yep. Come on up, Brett. Uh, Brett is with Jacob Schiff. Um, Marlene Panton. You still want to testify? Okay. Uh, she's with the Red Hook Conservancy. And um, Lynn Kennedy from my home borough, Friends of Astoria Heights Park. So we're going to call you guys up. Good afternoon, Chair Gredenshik and members of the committee. I'm Brett Dakin, a volunteer with the Jacob Schiff Playground Neighborhood Association. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. The association is a group of volunteers supporting Jacob Schiff Playground, a park of about four acres in Hamilton Heights, Manhattan. We're located in District 7, and we thank Council Member Mark Levine for his support. And we look forward to welcoming you, Chair Gredenshik, uh, along with Council Member Levine to our park later this week. So you can see it for yourself. I will be there. Um, the association strongly supports the call to protect our city's jointly operated playgrounds, or JOPs, from future non-park development. Jacob Schiff Playground may technically be classified as a JOP, but for our members and the thousands of folks who use it every week, the playground is a park. At nearly four acres, it is twice as big as the next largest JOP in our district, 
There is a children's playground in our park, but it represents a small portion of the footprint. We're also home to a synthetic turf field, a large seating area, two large lawns dotted with beautiful trees, and several basketball and handball courts, which are slated to be reconstructed beginning next year as part of a million dollar capital project currently in legal review. Our local middle school uses the playing fields and courts during school hours, but outside of school hours, the, these resources are booked solid by sports leagues from the neighborhood and throughout the city. The rest of the park is used by teenagers, young families, children, and the elderly from early in the morning until sundown seven days a week. Parks department employees provide all horticulture, maintenance, repair, and cleaning in the park. And we work closely with them as well as partnerships for parks and other nonprofit groups to provide programming in the park. We've held several It's My Park volunteer days to clean up and plant flowers. I'm not sure how successful they would have been if we had named them It's My Jointly Operated Playground <laughs> volunteer days. Uh, this summer alone, we, we hosted a Sing for Hope piano, a puppet mobile puppet show, two corporate volunteer groups, four creative artworks murals, a uni project public library, and a screening of A Wrinkle in Time. Our members and all the folks who use Jacob Schiff Playground would be very surprised to learn that it is classified as anything other than a park. In fact, this summer, a group of high school students from Creative Artworks made a short documentary film about the past, present, and future of Jacob Schiff Playground, and they named it In the Park. We are here to ensure that our city's JOPs are protected from non-park development. We understand that schools and housing are very important, but open space is a rare asset we must fight to protect. If any development is proposed in Jacob Schiff Playground, if anyone, for example, seeks to alienate it to facilitate the construction of a tower, we will be there to fight for our park and ensure that this essential open space remains available to our community forever. Thank you very much for your work and support of our parks and for your attention today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lakin. Ms. Panty. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Chair Gregramjic. I am Marlene Panton, Executive Director and Founder of Record Conservancy. I and seven core members, with support from hundreds of volunteers, maintain and beautify 16 parks and open spaces throughout the year in Red Hook, Brooklyn, in Council Member Menchaca's district of uh, Council District 38. But I reside in Council Member Brad Lander Lander's district 39. Like others here, I am dismayed at the current plans for construction in what is now the Marx Brothers Playground in Harlem and the precedent that sets for other JOPs across New York City. I am concerned that similar efforts will ensue in the future where other JOPs, like the six that exist in Council Districts 38 and 39, are sacrificed in the either or argument of housing versus parks or education versus parks or something else versus parks. There is no need to triage housing, parks, and education in New York City. They are all important. And like parks, JOPs are major recreational assets that should be protected from future development. I don't think there is anyone here who would argue with the addition of new schools or the availability of more housing. But this precedent will create a vague public policy where the criteria for a park shift in the wind as real estate and power interests cloud the minds of decision makers. One has to look no further for examples of the impact of obscure public policy than the hoodwink that is affordable housing. At one time, housing construction was described in terms of low income, middle income, high income. But with the shift to the term affordable housing, which means different things to different people, it has enabled an, an um, ambiguous and false narrative to take hold of New York's housing policy to the detriment of many New Yorkers. Similarly, efforts to circumvent the rules that JOPs are parkland, I, parkland will, I fear, lead to a slow, insidious policy change that reframes and justifies the alienation of JOP for future development. I therefore ask that all council members stand firm and reiterate that JOPs are parks. And like all parks, protective policies should be enacted to ensure that JOPs are available to communities well into the future. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Panton. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to come out this evening to support and support the majority owner operator park and the playground in Jacob Schiff for children and parks and housing. My name is Elizabeth Kennedy, and I am the co-founder and friend of the Storyline Park, which is a group of volunteers from the neighborhood surrounding the park located at 36th Street in Fairview, Ontario. 
working is it on yes okay i know i can hear that <laughs> welcome to the 21st century go wow. ahead <laughs> just took a button we could do that with parks okay um <laughs> so the uh park is located uh next to adjacent to is 10 middle school uh, which is a jop site um, our group has been in existence since 2013 when we began advocating with our electeds for a safer and more beautiful park space. We are the recipients of funding that has allowed for a renovation of the park space. Recently reopened in May of this year, we received 2.2 million on behalf of Mayor de Blasio through the CPI initiative in Parks Without Borders, 1.5 million from the Department of Environmental Protection, 1.1 million from Council Member Costantinidis, who's not here anymore, and 1 million from Borough President Melinda Katz. The Friends of Astoria Heights Park has been active since 2013 in hosting relevant programming for all members of the community. The park space is heavily util utilized with many diverse ethnic groups of varying ages. The park is utilized by families with toddlers, youth for sports training, seniors for Tai Chi and relaxation, adults taking exercise classes, adolescents volunteering to take care of trees, and much more. Our park group has also worked carefully to develop relationships with all neighborhood schools that utilize the park. Our newly painted track, renovated tennis courts, and shady nooks created by more mature trees are as popular as I have ever witnessed and provides much needed reprieve from the city's cement. Not only does the park group and parks department provide programming, but the park is a place where people see their friends and it feels like family. There are simply not enough green and public spaces available to support our densely populated neighborhoods needs. Parks and playgrounds support a healthy lifestyle, physical and mental. We cannot afford to lose any park space, especially in our district, which falls short of the citywide average of green acreage. In terms of developing New York City parks and playgrounds, our history is actually quite short and took the vision of more progressive thinkers to recognize the value and to educate others of the importance of these kinds of spaces. As a mother of a younger child who uses all of the jointly operated spaces in the district, and as a co-founder of a group that has worked years to improve a park, one park, I ask you to carefully consider, committee, um, of protecting our city's parks and playground spaces, especially those that are jointly operated and in which are at higher risk of unthoughtful and likely unnecessary overdevelopment, which will undoubtedly have a negative impact upon the quality of all of our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before you go, and I'm going to ask this of any panel, of every panel, um, I, would you agree that the people that use the JOPs that uh, you represent would be kind of surprised to find out they were not designated city park land. Is that a yes? Yes. Oh. Overall, yes. Um, our park actually was often referred to as uh, the IS-10 park. Um, however, um, before our friends group had come along, uh, there really the park was falling apart, and it wasn't either maintained by the parks department or IS-10, quite frankly. So it really took the, parks to, the, the Friends Group to revitalize this park space and to advocate for it. I, I think I was at the meetings when we yeah. were representing the borough so president. So I'm sort point. of, I'm in the middle of, you know, <laughs> well, being a would, happy would recipient you, would, of funding. I, I understand also, all that, but would, yeah. you would be, you, the people that used the park, Astoria Heights, would be kind of surprised that it wasn't a, it wasn't a city park. They wouldn't understand this. Okay. So, so, yeah. um, <laughs> and would you say that, um, that if they were no longer there, these three join out one, two, six. Um, these eight joint operated playgrounds, parks uh, would be devastating to your communities if they were no longer there. Absolutely, there is yes. no other space in our neighborhood. Okay, thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you for your testimony. You. Okay, um, the next, Pat, what? Uh, the next panel, we have two more panels, Rachel Levy from the Friends of the Upper East Side, Renee Patterson from the Seton Falls Park Preservation Coalition, 
and Joanna Cawley from the Carnegie Hill Neighbors. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna, there were three of you, so I am going to make you guys, if you'll all come together, that'll be nicer. So, um, George Janes from uh, the GMJAA. So, I'm gonna hold off on the Carnegie Hill, we'll hold you till the next one, if that's okay. Okay, okay, okay. so it's, for this panel, Rachel Levy, Renee Patterson, and George Janes. Ms. Levy, if you would begin. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Grudenchik, and well, no other council members, but good afternoon yeah, in any I, case. I represent <laughs> them all, so. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rachel Levy. I'm the Executive Director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Friends of the Upper East Side is a 36-year-old nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the livability, sense of place, of the diverse neighborhoods that comprise the Upper East Side. This concern for neighborhood preservation necessitates sound planning as a vital tool of balanced urban development. And among the most important elements that contribute to livable urban environments and neighborhood character is of course our parkland, providing critical recreational and open space in a dense city. In recognition of parkland as an essential yet finite resource in New York City, parkland has rightly been the subject of high standards of protection. Jointly operated playgrounds, as you know, a subset of over 250 public parks spread across all five boroughs, are deserving of that same level of protection. JOPs fulfill the same open space and recreation needs for a wide variety of communities, often those who lack other nearby park access. The recent development initi initiated by the city at Marx Brothers Playground raises troubling issues for JOPs citywide. Marx Brothers Playground sits at the intersection of the Upper East Side and East Harlem on 96th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues, a portion of the city where less than 1% of land area is devoted to parks and open space. Indeed, while Manhattan as a whole averages 567 residents per acre of parkland, on the Upper East Side, over 4,000 people share that same acre. Since its dedication by the city over 70 years ago, Marx Brothers Playground has been in continuous public use as one of the only such open spaces in this park-starved neighborhood. It has been the site of Little League baseball games, soccer matches, and other recreational uses by countless individuals and families living within a five-minute walk. The 1.3 million square foot development at the site of Marx Brothers Playground would eliminate this critical open space with no binding commitment to replace the parkland in kind or in value, as you've heard. By extracting air rights from the park to facilitate the private developer's 700-foot-tall residential tower, it would also overturn the foundational principle that parks do not generate development rights. This unprecedented and illegal action is what led friends to join our fellow, fellow civic organizations in filing a lawsuit ch to challenge these actions. As stated by former Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe in his affidavit in the case, it is indisputable that the Marx Brothers Playground is a park with no development rights. The taking of public parkland at Marx Brothers Playground to facilitate development contradicts long-standing policy on parkland and creates a dangerous precedent for JLPs and other small parks citywide. These spaces are critical elements in the network of open spaces that serve the public and deserve the same legal protections as other New York City parkland. Friends urges the City Council to recognize the implications of the actions affecting Marx Brothers Playground and to take steps to ensure the long-term protection of JLPs immediately. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Patterson? Good afternoon. Is it on? Good afternoon, Council, Council Chair and Council Members. My name is Renee Patterson, and I'm President of the Seton Falls Park Coalition. Seton Falls Park falls in the jurisdiction of Council Member King, District Community Board 12. The Seton Falls Park Preservation Coalition has been a friends group for Seton Falls Park since 1990, under the past president of Christine Foreman and reactivated in 2012 by Anita Haywood and I, Renee Patterson. We request that playgrounds and parkland remain free from development and protected. 
The coalition was fortunate enough to receive our first Park Equity Initiative grant in 2017. This grant enables the coalition to initiate our two goals to pr preservation and promotion of Seton Hall Park and Stars and Stripes Playground. The coalition's efforts to help preserve the park have culminated with the Parks Department's Green Neighborhood Program, selecting Seton Falls Park for a 10-month residency to help remove invasive plants and care for community street trees. In addition, the coalition has organized with Partnerships for the Park and the uh, and community for It's My Park Cleanup. Preservation of Seton Falls Park has led to many initiatives to promote the park. The coalition has promoted Parks Department Urban Park Ranges to conduct nature tours through our park trails. We have hosted City Parks Foundations, Movies Under the Stars, and Coalition's Most Talked About Program, Fitness in the Park. An exercise program, the Park Equity Initiative Grant helps to maintain June through October. Seton Falls Park and Stars and Stripes Playground is responsible for the outdoor recreation of the John Philip Sousa Middle School campus, which houses the following three schools, the Baychester School, Bronx Land School, and One World School. Our park is overutilized. Where shall our children play and adults relax? The coalition is well aware of the affordable housing problem that plagues the city of New York, but most residents, when looking for dwellings, usually ask how close the apartment or house is to a park or school. New York City is not a pleasant, livable place without parkland they deserve, and protection is needed yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Patterson and Mr. Jaynes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is George James. I'm a urban planner. I work professionally on this project for the community board okay. um, and then for um, Carnegie Hill neighbors. Um, here I am here representing myself today because I think this is really important. So um, I prepared a, a little deck uh, which I'm going to talk through. Um, so the first slide talks about what they're trying to do here at Marx Brothers Playground. And the point of this is simply to say that it's a jointly operated playground now. And the proposal is that it's going to be a jointly operated playground after the, the new building and adjacent school are built. And that's important uh, because you know, the issue of whether it's a park or not is, talks about the legality of, of this building. And, and to be clear to you, uh, Chairman, is that I'm not a parks person. I'm just, I do zoning and land use. I, I, I'm not here as an advocate for a park We're at all. We're all parks people. Well, <laughs> other than the user. Okay. <laughs> Um, That's important. Without users, we'd have no parks, <laughs> trust me. Um, so, so ECF, I'm, I'm going to quote some of the things that were in the ULERP application for this. Um, Marx Brothers Playground and the EIS. Uh, the Marx Brothers Playground has always been a JOP and not a park. Out of an abundance of caution and perhaps under the mistaken belief that the playground was parkland, the MTA sought alienation legislation in 2004, as you know. Um, although the MVP is not and has never been parkland, the city and ECF has determined that it is prudent to obtain new alienation legislation. Um, and then finally, we have discussed with DCP the status of the playground under the zoning resolution and have been advised that as a JOP, it is not considered a public park. Now, um, what's amazing to me, you know, I went through this, I heard all this, and I was, the MTA saw alienation when they didn't have to? That sounded amazing to me at the time, but I believed it. I believed it because it was in the ULERP application, and generally speaking, you know, those those applications are as truthful as they can be. Now, it, it's possible they visited the site, and it looked very much. I've looked at it on Google Earth, and I've saw the maple leaf, and uh, you know, it looks like a park to me. So, so the most maybe that's <laughs> what they saw as well. Well, so the thing that I, ca I can't believe hasn't been said yet is Plan YC. We all remember Plan YC, or at mm -hmm. least I do, because I'm an urban planner, and uh, this came out, and on page 32 of Plan YC, it says, since 1938, JOPs have been considered designated parkland, which restricts how the land can be used. And in fact, when you go into the records, and the thing is about government, it produces records and paper. And if you go back 70 years, JOPs have been considered parkland. And the fact that they are it, it, just a really very simple review of the record, you'll see that. It's not only 
not only in Bloomberg, but in Giuliani and Dinkins and Koch and Lindsay. It goes back in time. And, you know, I have on the next page the, the New York Times, the p article featuring the Department of Parks' new Manhattan playground. Um, and there's a, there's a record here. And, you know, the question is, is from a zoning perspective, I'm not going to talk about map parkland, but from a zoning perspective, why does it matter? Because I, I have a page here for you, sir, of the, the zoning on this, is that district designations on zoning maps do not apply to parks. And a block is defined by either streets or parks. And then a zoning lot is either a tract of land um, located within a single park. So if JOPs are parks, this building, this development, this entire development at Marx Brothers is illegal, not only under city law, but under state law, because the building that they're proposing, if you just look at the land that they are using on their zoning lot, is 26 FAR. We don't have any 26 FAR districts, and under the multiple dwelling law, it's, you're limited to 12, as you, I'm sure you know. Um, so it is, this, li this development can't work if JOPs are parks. Um, it's illegal. All right, so the citywide impacts. I've been talking about this as, as Marx Brothers, but as you know, there's a bunch of these. And if this is right, we've just made 270 publicly owned development sites. And speaking as a planner and land use person, you know, that might be good for New York City. I don't know. But the problem is, is it's followed no process Right? We have a process, process for land use decisions. The public was never asked, the community boards were never asked, the borough presidents were never asked, and you were never asked. And that, and also, there was no environmental review. We've just permitted, or allowed development for 10 Empire State buildings and no one's analyzed the environmental review for that. This was a decree. It was a decree that's not based upon law and it's not how land use decisions are made in New York. I think the council was asked, but uh, I'll leave that to my council to determine. But um, I agree uh, with most of what you had to say. Um, uh, and so that's one of the reasons, certainly the reason that we're here today. Sure. And I would ask, uh, I, I, since you're representing not a specific park, but Ms. Patterson, you certainly are representing some uh, JOPs and it would be, would you say, a, a huge effect on, on your community if these would no longer uh, be usable as parkland? Absolutely. Okay. And would you, Absolutely. would you also say that the people that use that park have no idea that it's technically not a park, only in a technical sense? No idea. Okay. Is that the same for you, Ms. Le Levy? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Well, um, yes, on both? Yes. Okay. I thank you all very much, and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to call up the final. You're dismissed. I call up the final panel, um, which are all Carnegie Hill neighbors. It's good to see neighbors get along so well. Um, there's actually one more, so I'm going to ask Mr. I'm going to ask Miss Cauley uh, Low Van Der Vol. Um, actually, he filled out two slips. It looked like, yeah. unless they're two Low Van Der Wolfs, both living at 11. Okay. And then um, Mr. Alexander Adams as well. So if you would all come up, and then I'm going to call back uh, Mr. Drury and Mr. Estelle for a quick question that I have. Okay. You can give it to the Sergeant at Arms. Thank you. I don't want to get in trouble with this union. Um, so Ms. Cawley left uh, Mr. Vandervolk, and then uh, is it Vandervolk? Vandervolk, yes. Okay, I appreciate that with my name being Grodenchik. Um, it's not easy <laughs> some days. And then uh, after that, Mr. Adams. Where's the button? Uh, you'll see it on the bottom, right in front. Bingo. Wait, I'm on? I don't know. Let's hear you. Should I again? Now you're on. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, First, we, we want to thank you, uh, um, Chair uh, Grodinchik, 
for holding this uh, this this hearing. Um, this is a it's a it's a great opportunity for all the issues related to this complex um, situation we're facing with Marx Brothers uh, proposed development. So we we are very appreciative of this <coughs> of this opportunity. <coughs> um, I'm in full agreement with um, all the testimony given by uh, earlier by uh, Elizabeth Goldstein of the um, Municipal Art Society and by Lynn Kelly of the New Yorkers for Parks and, and Carter Strickland of, uh, of um, the Trust for Public Land. I mean, our organization uh, is in full agreement with uh, the, the statements made. So um, I'm not going to uh, uh, dwell on that, but I am going to dwell on, on, on an interesting phenomenon. We attended, because Carnegie Hill uh, uh, is part, part of Carnegie Hill is in Community Board 11 and, 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 and uh, Lower Harlem, and, and we follow those uh, developments in their community, and we were struck by the huge tower, and we thought we ought to look into this and, and find out more about why this application had been presented. Um, our, so our initial opposition to the project was focused on the, uh, on the extraordinary height of the residential tower, which almost twice the height of even the tallest nearby apartment buildings in this residential community. We accepted the explanation put forward by ECF and the city that once Marx Brothers Playground was moved to the center of the block and construction of the tower and three schools had been completed, the land of the playground would be returned to the city and again placed under the control of the parks department. So what's there to complain? We, we were not yet as sophisticated in our, in our understanding of, of the laws governing uh, and, and the practices governing parks at that time. Um, we, we, uh, we did it find it uh, strange, and, and this seemingly slight of hand uh, <coughs> a sequence of actions could be allowed. I mean, we did think that there you were creating uh, air rights for development, and then you could return the land <laughs> back to the park. So everybody supposedly wins. You get the park back, and the air rights for development allow schools to be, d uh, to be built and affordable housing, supposedly. Uh, even though that's controversial. Uh, so our solution was to accept this, uh, these arguments, and ask instead for an alternative to the proposed single tall tower that would, uh, and our suggestion was, why don't you build two towers, no, no more than 400 feet tall. And, uh, and, and, the, uh, and this, would, uh, this would create a better, uh, a better um, context for the community. Uh, we asked our zoning consultant, uh, George Janes, to create, uh, he just testified, a 3D model of this solution for presentation purposes. And even as we proposed the two-tower solution, <coughs> our pro bono attorney, Carolyn Harris of Goldman Harris, <coughs> initially made clear that we should abandon this pro proposal because it still involved the same extraction of development rights from the playground as the, as the original proposal. She reluctantly agreed to a compromise where we presented both proposals to the community board and said, you, you, uh, you, you, can, you, you have the choice before you, but, but we, we, favor a, 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 we, we favor either, uh, either following <coughs> either a, a smaller development that would not need the air rights, or if you're going to use the air rights, then two towers. That was our, our proposal. Um, now, we lost that battle, and it went to the city council, and the city council approved, and we were like the lone, uh, there was no one out there to support our position uh, at that time, because no one understood this. And it, it wasn't properly vetted, as, as has been repeatedly stated here. Shortly after the city council hearing in June, in June 2017, and subsequent approval, we re-examined the issues and became convinced of the full import of the role of playgrounds as, as parks, and, and by that I mean JO, JO, JOPs as parks, and also the principal uh, concept that once development rights are assigned 
to a built structure, the land is forever tied to that structure and cannot be returned as parkland. It is with these arguments that we appealed to the governor to veto the alienation bill, which, which had been passed in both houses of the state. That appeal was heeded when the governor on October 23, uh, 2017, proposed his attenuated solution that before the project is allowed to proceed, the state commissioner of parks should make a, de a definitive determination whether indeed Marx Brothers Playground could be deemed as either parkland or not parkland. And if the result was parkland, he indicated that there could be no development rights. Thank you. That's, and that's, where, that's how we came to where we are today. You are you're the last of the Mohegans here, but we're going to have actually have the city back. But I do appreciate both of you sticking around um, uh, to make sure that you're, we hear from you. Thank you very much. Um, and my name is Alexander Adams. I'm the executive director of Citizens Civitas, mm -hmm. uh, Civitas Citizens, Inc. And I'm actually joined today by four of our board members here, as well as four partners uh, in this court case. So a lot of folks uh, here on behalf of this issue and have stuck around as well. We thank everyone. Um, I have prepared remarks uh, for you written from the board that agrees, um, and we agree with most of what's gone on. But I wanted to give you uh, some context and say that we're deeply concerned that these playgrounds are not being treated as parks. And the matter, the issue here, the underlying issue really becomes, do they have development rights? I mean, this is really what ends up coming out of this. Um, these small parks, most of them are very small. We're not talking about huge, you know, we heard Pelham Bay or Central Park. No, these are small are, are, neighborhood no, yeah. parks. Um, these are places where people walk. They don't, you know, go for big barbecues and things. In, in my district, some of them are attached to places that are city parks, actually. But yes, and, and now so I have there's to go a back and take a look. There's <laughs> a lot of mixture there. Yes. Um, so, uh, without getting into all those technicalities, if you look at it, these small parks are some of the most heavily used. And they're located in 49 of the 51 council districts. So this is not just one park, although we're party to that lawsuit as well. This is about a very large issue. Um, there's a lot, like I said, of legal codes, interpretations regarding parks, playgrounds, JOPs. But I think it comes down to the very simple, you know, if you were to go as a council person to any of these JOPs and ask 20 people on the street, your constituents, is this space a park? I, th I think, if you try, I think all 20 would say, yes, it's a park. Why are you asking me? I mean, you know. Um, so residents believe that these are their neighborhood parks. There is a legal side, but I think what comes out of this is that the city council has the right to set policies. You're the one that sets laws for the city. And I think what's needed here is for this committee and for the city council to make a clear statement. There's a lot of mud in the water. We need a clear statement. And city council has that ability to make that clear statement whether it's to designate these parks, whether it's to come up with another MOU, whatever it is, you could clarify everything by making a clear statement. And the last thing I'll say is we're not creating any more land. So this is uh, an item that is super important to everyone. Thank you. Thank you uh, both very, very much. Yes, Mr. Vanderbilt. Um, I'd like to make one, uh, one addition. When, when after the city council had approved in the summer of uh, 2017 the project, um, we, uh, we then, we, we were not alone. We then uh, uh, reached out to the Municipal Arts Society, 
to uh, Trust for Public Land, New Yorkers for Parks. Friends was al already with us, and Civitas was in the background. So we didn't do this alone and to no, get the, I'm aware to get of the that, yes. governor's decision. So just wanted to recognize well, that. We'll see what the governor's parks commissioner decides. Um, but I thank you uh, all for being here today, and thank you for your testimony and for your passion for our public lands. Um, Mr. Jury and Mr. Estelle, I'd just like to bring you back for one quick question. The council would remind you that you're under oath, but I already did. So uh, the, the only question that um, came to my mind while people were testifying, uh, are either of you gentlemen aware of any land that in, let's say, the last 10 or 20 years that's gone from what was used as what would I might consider, or anybody might consider parkland, um, to another use, and what would that use be? I can speak to, for JOP specifically, uh, I can, you know, there have certainly been incidents of the school using the, its property under its, you know, right. jurisdiction and control for school expansion or things mm -hmm. like that. I'm so not it's aware. it's been school expansion. I'm not a, yes, I mean, okay. absolutely. To the degree that there's been any sort of infringement or, or imposition into that, that footprint, my understanding is, uh, generally speaking, it's, it's been for a specific school use, which I, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but it's, right. you know, sort of the point that DOE, you know, understandably wanting to retain that flexibility, you know, for, for that sort of use. Understandable to me. I mean, not to everybody, but I get it. Yeah, I've certainly been around longer than I'd like to admit, and... You already admitted to it. So I know. I admit worry. again. I'm under testimony, I know. <laughs> um, anyway, so any of these uh, joint operated parks or these playgrounds, uh, schoolyards to playgrounds, have only been used for school purposes, in my recollection, throughout my years. Okay. All right, thank you both. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, obviously, if you have any further thoughts, you can certainly uh, communicate them to me um, as a chair of this committee. You've given us much to think about today. And I thank you for taking time from your busy schedules to be with us on this uh, Monday afternoon. Um, we will be meeting next month. We haven't had a topic approved yet. Has it been approved? Not yet. Yes. Well, people can always send in testimony. Um, that's not a problem. I will add it to uh, my file, and, and as will um, the council. Uh, we urge people to do that as quickly as possible. Um, certainly, you're, you're always uh, able to communicate with me, and I meet uh, quite frequently uh, with uh, advocates for parks. Uh, Ms. Kelly and I have become very good friends over the last few months, uh, as some of the others in this room. Um, and that's all to the good, um, because when I uh, hear from people who love parks and I visit parks, it makes me a better parks chair. So um, with that, um, I thank you again for being here today, and I close this hearing.